schools are in crisis. Tonight, News 10 NBC searches for answers from Rochester all the way to Washington, D.C. A New York State Exposed education special, The Power of Choice. Hi, my name is Derek Dalton. I'm Vice President, General Manager of News 10 NBC. Tonight, we're going to show you a special with some very disturbing numbers regarding our children in the Rochester City School District, which some may not want you to see. But we're going to show you because it's just too important. For instance, did you know that one out of 10 black males graduate high school in four years? That's dead last in the United States. And 10,000 of our children are in failing schools. On top of that, it costs approximately $21,000 to educate each student which is $9,000 more than the national average. This is a travesty. And don't forget, this impacts all of us. Whether you're in Brighton or in the city or up in Spencerport or Webster, it impacts you with higher taxes, increased crime, increased poverty. But most important, we're failing the kids who need us most. And this has been going on way too long. We've been stymied by politics and infighting between the union, the school board, the superintendent, and legislators. At times, I think the leadership forgets who they serve. They're supposed to serve our children. We have to demand more competitive alternatives. Why don't we have pilot schools that have been so successful in Massachusetts? Or more charters like in Washington, D.C. or New Orleans? or even vouchers for faith-based initiatives. Now we know there are many great caring and loving professionals in the Rochester City School District. This has nothing to do about them. This really has everything to do about this system. It's broken. That's why throughout the year, we're gonna keep fighting for you and our children, for putting the power of choice back in the parents' hands where it belongs. So after you watch this, please email me or call me and let me know your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. So I do what I do because I believe that education is the greatest equalizer. And I believe that there are too many children who simply because of color of their skin or their zip code don't have access to quality education. I like that it's not like any ordinary school. They make learning fun. I learned to be professional. You felt like you were a number just, person. Right, just a number. And in here? I feel like a student. I feel like family, you know. I feel the love. And that was actually pretty exciting. It's like, oh, we're doing our job here because now they're feeling like they have to compete. They have to treat parents like consumers. Um, they have to actually care about their community and know something about their community. That was never happening before. So why do parents in Rochester not have a choice? I'm Scott Kilberry. I'm Janet Lomax. Plain and simple, Rochester City Schools are failing, and they're failing beyond state standards. Just ask the parents. I am very, very nervous about how she's going to get to school and if she's going to be safe. I would choose a different school that I think I know they would get a better education. Even if I have to leave Rochester, she's going to graduate. Why not allow families a way out? Allow parents to choose high-achieving schools. Take a look at Rochester's results and ask yourself, don't we owe our children a better choice? Just released, the State of New York's Failing Schools Report finds 15 of Rochester City schools are failing. That's more than 10,000 students in schools lagging behind the state averages in every category. Plus, Buffalo Business First has been ranking New York school districts for over 20 years, and the report puts Rochester dead last in all of upstate New York. 432 out of 432. It's not hard to see why. 28% of students drop out and only 5% are college ready. Plus, just 43% of students graduate. The worst performance of all major city school districts in New York. And if you can believe it, it gets worse. Only 9% of black males graduate and only 10% of Latino males get a diploma in four years. 
These abysmal numbers can't be blamed on funding. Not even close. Rochester spends well over $21,000 per student with a total budget near $800 million. That's over $9,000 or 72% more per student than the national average. But still, school leaders say it's not enough. The superintendent says he needs millions more to get that job done. Let's be clear about this. This is an additional $36 million. We're going to invest um, in serving around 12,000 students on the enrichment program. We do know that we lose too many students during the summer because they don't have much to do. Certainly the cost goes way beyond the hundreds of millions of tax dollars we all spend on this system that's failing children. The cost in crime and lost business affects us all, and it gets worse. Our city, our home, is truly at the breaking point. Startling new numbers tonight. Rochester's poverty is worse than we may have first thought. A new report from Act Rochester says we are now tops in the nation among cities of a similar size for extreme poverty. Are you ready to demand our leaders put politics aside and offer a way out? Some say it's time for the power of choice. I have always been a proponent of school choice. I believe that the money should follow the child. So if that parent wants to send their child to a Catholic school or to a private school or to a charter school or to, uh, you know, Allen Del Columbia or wherever, that, that they should be given that option and that choice. I am pro-choice. Had you asked me that question 15 years ago, I would have said no, but I am so frustrated with the results that we have gotten out of our um, city school district that I feel that parents in this city, particularly poor parents, should have an op opportunity to select a school for their children to attend where they could be reasonably assured that they're going to have uh, good educational outcomes. Folks in western New York uh, and the rest of the state really do need these options and so we should put some more emphasis on how we can um, scale up school choice in those areas. And who's stopping that? The teachers union. I mean the status quo, people who are afraid of change. There are a number of problems facing children throughout our community. The most startling is the disparity when it comes to quality education and graduation rates, both of which are struggles for the Rochester City School District. However, the issues facing the City School District are issues that impact all of us, no matter where we live in this community. So tonight, we're going to talk about the power of choice. And if you want to see what is possible for schools in Rochester, then... We have to look at Washington, D.C. It's the capital of school choice and parent empowerment. And one of the leaders there is a woman who grew up right here in Rochester and knows what can happen if children just have the chance to get a seat in a good school. Berkeley Breen traveled to Washington to talk to her in Berkeley. What do we learn from her? Janet, we learned that poverty is a reason that children struggle, but it doesn't have to be an excuse. We learned that change is possible, but it only happens when there is pressure to change. What are we trying to figure out? This is Chantel Wright. She knows every child and parent's name. She's the founder and leader of Achievement Prep Charter School in Washington, D.C. Achievement Prep is located across the Anacostia River here in Ward 8. This is one of the toughest, poorest parts of town. Chantel wanted to build her school here because she didn't want the children in this area of D.C. to have to travel to a good school like she did. When I think about my scholars, I think about me. This is where Chantel grew up, a latchkey kid of a single mother living just off Thurston Road in Rochester. I'm going to come back and see you with your school shoes on your feet, and I'm going to bring you a new tie. Going into the seventh grade, Chantel and her mother had a choice that few students in the city get. She got accepted into the Urban Suburban Program in Brighton. Then, college, law school, and a job in a firm where, as she puts it, she made money for rich people. But after five years, she stopped. She left the life of corporate law and got into education. Education changed my life, and I believe, and it wasn't because I, you know, was this genius or my mom had all kinds of resources. It was truly my education. It gave her hope, which is what you hear in some of her students. I'm going to go to Massachusetts Institution of Technology, MIT. And I want to study astrophysics and eventually go to NASA. When you hear what Kevin wants to do, what, what do you think? Yay. <laughs> mothers like Deborah Green have a power that a lot of mothers in Rochester don't have, the power of choice. It means a lot to us. Um, 
it probably means more that we didn't have to pay for that education. In Washington, D.C., 45% of all students are in charter schools. The rest are in traditional district schools, but even those children get to choose what public school they want to go to. 20 years after choice became the law in D.C., the city's population is up, crime is down, and graduation is up 10%. It didn't always used to be that way. Scott Pearson is the executive director of the D.C. Charter School Board. DCPS used to be one of the worst school districts in the entire country, but it's gotten better. How did it get better? Well, the competition? That, that's, a, that's a matter of debate. I think competition had a big role to play. Why do you think they use sharp tools? Pearson says competition created the political will to make tough changes. The D.C. public schools enacted some of the toughest teacher evaluation standards in the country. For instance, one ineffective rating and the teacher is gone. I asked Chantel Wright to think about Rochester schools and the change that she thinks has to happen here. So this is what I tell my staff, Berkeley. We are brain surgeons. And at some point, as a surgeon, if you keep killing your patients, somebody's going to revoke your license. And you're not going to be able to practice anymore. But yet we look at schools and us as teachers and leaders and say, I can only graduate 45% and that's actually okay, that 55% aren't meeting it. And we don't do anything different. Rochester would have to triple the number of charter schools to reach critical mass. The city would have to go from the 14 now to around 40. Right now, only 14% of children are in charters. That's 4,200 children out of 28,000 students in the district. But here's the thing. I checked with the Department of Education in New York and SUNY. There is not one charter school application pending for Monroe County. Scott, not one. Wow, very interesting. Now, we heard Chantel Wright uh, say that 45% graduation rate is actually okay. But I don't think anybody in Rochester is saying that. No, nobody's saying that. But I think here's the point that uh, a change in the public school district in D.C. didn't happen until there was a critical mass of choice for parents in the form of charters and vouchers. And when teachers and children started to leave the district school system in D.C., the system started to change because what I'm told in D.C., the system had to change. It was in the system's best interest to change. Wow. All right, Berkeley, we're going to check back with you throughout the evening. Thank you for that report. But right now, many of you at home can get involved in this conversation as we speak. Tell us what you think about the idea of providing more choices for parents. We're going to share some of your thoughts throughout this special. Just use the hashtag Power of Choice on Twitter. Well, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says he's all about providing more options for parents and students across the state, but not everyone's on board. We'll break down his plan still ahead. Plus, we take a closer look at the school board and the salary. Does the wage fit the task or the result? That's straight ahead on tonight's Power of Choice special. I think what we're doing is working. Now, some people may have a hard time believing that, but I'm not saying to people, judge us on what has happened over the last three decades. I'm saying judge us on what's happened over the last four or five years. The Rochester City School District often criticized for its low graduation rates and high paying salaries for the administrative staff and teachers. Many say things aren't adding up. So we decided to take a look at the numbers, starting with the school board. Right now, at least seven members of the board make at least $23,000 a year. So, how does that compare to other areas? Well, as Berkeley Breen found out, it's significantly more than in places like Buffalo and Syracuse. Burke? Hey, Jenna, we want to first point out that no one's getting rich uh, being on the Rochester City School Board, but only three school boards in New York State get paid, and Rochester members get a whole lot more money than the other two, Buffalo and Syracuse. I'm shocked. Really? Larry Hall is a parent in the city school district. That was his reaction after we told him how much the city school board members get paid. I figure if some of the other school boards aren't getting paid, why is the Rochester school board getting paid like that? Why do school board members in the city make as much money as you do? While people may not believe it, it is an incredibly difficult job. Van White is the president of the city school board. It literally requires, if you're serious about it, that you give your all physically, spiritually, and intellectually. Each member of the city school board gets almost $23,000 a year. As president, Van White makes a little more than 30000 In Syracuse, board members make 7500 a year. And in Buffalo, it's only 5000 But I can tell you, those people in Buffalo who do the job in Buffalo, many of them... I believe that 
they're not paid enough. He's right. Last year, the Buffalo School Board requested a pay raise. The $5,000 they make right now is exactly what they made in the mid-70s. Adjusted for inflation, the Buffalo School Board salary should be around 20000 The Syracuse Board made a similar request, asking that their salary be increased to 21000 Do you think they, they should be compensated, school board members? Um, generally, no. Jody Siegel is the president of the Monroe County School Board Association. There are no suburban or rural districts in New York State that pay their school board members. There is some feeling among lots of school board members that they do this as a volunteer because they believe that is a good way to keep anyone from thinking they're doing any of this as part of any self-interest. Van White, a full-time lawyer, says he puts in six to seven hours a day working on school district issues. I feel very comfortable saying every board member earns every dollar that they earn. But they, by the way, they don't do it for the money. So you do it for nothing? I would. Oh, I absolutely would. Now, the main role of the school board is to set policy and hold the superintendent accountable. And Van White told me that uh, the Rochester City School Board is enforcing 29 policies enacted by the board over the last 20 years that he says have never been enforced. And he says they have regularly scheduled meetings with school principals where they look at attendance and test scores. So they're trying to hold those principals accountable. You know, you mentioned a push to increase the school board salaries in Buffalo and Syracuse. What's happening with that? Well, the pay hike and the request in Syracuse, that never happened. Nothing happened with the, the proposal in Buffalo, but we should mention that according to the Buffalo News, on top of that $5,000 stipend for Buffalo school board members, they get $5,000 in travel expenses, and the, the board budgets $20,000 a year on meals for board members at their weekly meetings. One other note, Janet, Rochester City Council members make $34,000 a year. The city budget, $300 million less than the school district's budget. So they've basically got a smaller budget, but they make more money. Something to think about yep. there. Burke, thank you. Failing schools are plaguing city school districts across the country. However, the difference we found is that other states have addressed this problem by putting the control of education back in the hands of parents and using their tax dollars to fund the initiative. To lift the sanctions that have been in place. Shannon Joy is a local radio personality, but she makes it clear she's a mother first. And following last month's Common Core testing, she's not entirely happy about the way the government has a hand in their education. If you are really looking at the best interest of a child, it would make sense to put most control into the hands of the parent. What we're going to do today is use... Outside of New York, parents have more of a voice. There are currently 26 states across the country that use some form of voucher system or a school choice program. Whether it's a public school, charter, private, or religious school, vouchers give parents the choice to decide where their school tax money is spent. We see that they have academic benefits. Paul DePerna is the research director of the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. A Friedman study released last month showed low-income school choice students in Baltimore graduate earlier and attend college at a significantly higher rate than their peers. 98% of those students were likely to graduate. In order for a true school voucher program to work in New York, it would require that the state's constitution be changed, eliminating what's known as the Blaine Amendment, which prohibits public money from going to religious schools. Something debated just a couple of years ago in the state assembly. So we went to state assembly majority leader Joe Morelli. Shouldn't families have a choice, another option to send their children somewhere else? Yes, and I think that's really why the charter school system has developed. You know, the proponents of this back to the voucher system suggest that uh, competition is going to challenge the state to use their dollars more wisely, and the competition would be good. Well, I think that's, but I think we do that in the charter school system. So, um, you know, there's different ways of getting it. As I said, we have opted to create charter schools, and there's obviously a lot of conversation about lifting the cap. There's also conversation, as I said, about the tax credit. So I think the voucher isn't going to happen in New York. I think we're looking at other models that would still achieve the same goals. The tax credit Morelli mentioned, which the New York State Senate just passed, would be a way around the Blaine Amendment. 
The Education Investment Tax Credit would give a tax break to scholarship donors and allow parents of children in one of the 15 failing schools in the Rochester City School District to use a scholarship to send their child to a private or religious school of their choice. The Education Investment uh, Tax Credit has passed the Senate. Any chance you see it getting through the Assembly? You know, we've talked about it at length. Uh, I don't think that we've made a decision. We will probably have uh, more discussion this year before the end of session, make a determination on whether or not uh, we want to take it up. The movement, in fact, continues. Governor Cuomo announcing his plan just a few weeks ago, which he says gives power to parents and students. Cuomo says basically if you have the money, you can move to the suburbs. If you don't, you virtually have no options. He says his Parental Choice and Education Act is all about choice, and he hopes this time around there will be enough votes to make it happen. However, as Berkeley Breen reports, Cuomo admits this will be an uphill battle, despite the growing support from some of the most powerful religious leaders in New York State. And I honor your choice. The governor said education and a parent's choice about education for their child is the most important issue in the state right now. Education is the civil rights issue of today. It's called the Parental Choice in Education Act. It's backed by Jewish, Muslim, and Christian leaders in New York. The most vocal champion is Cardinal Dolan of New York City. We don't care where they're at, public, private, religious, you, who cares? We just got to help our kids, and this is going to do that. So what, what do you say to those assemblymen and, and senators in the Rochester area who this, haven't voted for this before? This is a, a no-brainer. Listen to your people. Listen to your leadership. They're all on board. Uh, we need you more than ever. This is about our kids. And, the, and anything to help our kids in whatever school they're at, bingo. If you look at uh, private schools, whether they're Catholic schools, Jewish schools, and any independent religious schools, and suburban schools, one of the reasons that those schools collectively are high performing is those schools are chosen by parents. So if people and parents in cities like Rochester had choice, the schools would get better? By, by all means. The governor says this has to come to a vote in the next four weeks. Cuomo says the powers and special interests in Albany are against it. You know who's in favor of it? The people in this state are in favor of it. That means you have to speak up. You have to make your voice heard. Democracy only works when you stand up. And you have to say to your assembly people and senators, don't come home from Albany unless you pass that education tax credit, because if you do, I'm not sending you back. Well, that legislation is heading back in front of lawmakers soon. And whether you agree or disagree, you can let them know your thoughts. Here are the lawmakers with the most influence when it comes to making this decision. The president of the Senate, Senator John Flanagan. His email address is nysenate.gov. And the Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Hasty. His email address is speaker at assembly.state.ny.us. You can also contact local lawmakers. We have all that contact information on our website. Just go to whec.com, click on News, and then look for the Contact Your Elected Officials banner. You'll find it on the right-hand side of the page. Well, many critics of alternatives like charter schools say that those types of programs take some of the best and brightest students away from public schools. But one school district in Washington, D.C. says the answer is simple. If you want the best, you have to fight for it. Still ahead, we go back to D.C. where school leaders are literally going door to door to recruit scholars. I'm a proponent and a supporter of school choice, and I think that that's important that we give our children a fighting chance. Along with choice comes competition. Some claim that's the problem now, that charters hand-select the brightest students. But in Washington, D.C., where right now nearly half of the students are enrolled in charter schools, the competition is forcing principals in the traditional public schools to do something we've never seen before, that's recruit their students. Once again, we sent Berkeley Breen to Washington, D.C. to see if it's making a difference. Berkeley. All right, here's what I learned. D.C. is not perfect. They still count tens of thousands of children in failing schools, and there's still a significant gap between white children and black and Latino children. But overall, the numbers say it's better than it used to be. And a factor as to why things changed was competition. Take this principal of a Washington, D.C. public elementary school. She went door to door last summer recruiting students because if she didn't, they could go somewhere else. For me as a principal, 
It is really a great thing to go out into the community, meet people face to face. Isabella Miller is the principal of Amadon Bowen Elementary School. It's part of the Washington, D.C. Public School District. This is one of the streets that she went door to door recruiting students. When you're walking down this street and you're knocking on these doors mm -hmm. and you're telling parents or guardians, I want your child to come to my school, what right. do they say to you? Uh, that depends. So normally it's like, oh, hi, Ms. Miller, it's good to see you, right? Keep I'm on. like, you know what we can do? Come to my school, come observe the classes, come talk to the teachers, come talk to students. Like today when you are interviewing to parents, I had three more parents come and sit in the classrooms who are choosing that school who would normally not consider it, right? Your principal, Isabella Miller, last summer went door to door recruiting students to come to the school. What did you think of that? I think it was great. I think it was very wise of her to go door to door to sort of like evangelize DC public schools. Norma Fisher Jones chose to have her daughters go to this school. So did Martin Wells. He has three children here. We're an extended day school. In the District of Columbia, that's the power of choice that parents have. They can choose to send their child to a charter school or any district school they want. Rather than take my kids to a better school, I decided I'll spend the time that I'd normally commute and help improve this school. The Cherry Blossom Festival, they're going to be in the Civil War Parade. Wells gave us a whirlwind tour of the school. New classrooms, new art rooms, new playgrounds. Wells likes choice. He took advantage of it, but he's critical of charters. He says they take motivated parents out of neighborhood schools and they're not subject to the same scrutiny. You have taxpayer dollars that are accountable under the D.C. public school system that are diverted into private hands, into charity hands, with no accountability. Wells says D.C. charters are not subject to freedom of information requests. He says it took a lawsuit to show one charter operator paid himself a million dollars a year. It's important for the people of Rochester to make sure that they have accountability on their tax dollars. But in the classroom, what has the power of choice done at Amadon Bowen Elementary School? Proficiency scores in math and English are up. Five years ago, they had 230 students. Now, they're at 375. Do you feel like there's competition out there, like you're competing for children to come to your school because they could go other places, other schools? In a way, yes. In a way, yes. So there is, um, I think in, a, in some ways, it's a, it's a healthy competition. So basically, you're showing this is what our school is made of. And not only can we meet the needs of your child, but we actually can exceed them. You're, you're marketing your That's school correct. to local families. I have to, yes. All right, two quick points here. First of all, charters in New York State are subject to freedom of information laws. And I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture of D.C. schools. They estimate there are still 40,000 children in failing schools in, in D.C., both in district and in charter schools. The question is, what do they do with the failing schools? Coming up tonight at 11, you're going to meet the man who has the power to make them go away. Scott? Well, it's interesting. We talked about the enrollment in D.C. district schools and charter schools. Both of those are up. Now, why do people think that's happening? Well, a big factor is the terrible traffic in D.C. We got caught in it a couple of times when we were down there. People tired of the commute, move back into the city with their families. And parts of D.C. are getting gentrified. We, we saw those parts. Our traffic in Rochester, just not bad enough to make that happen here. But the parents I talked to down in D.C. also credit the changes in the schools. They knew, Scott, that they could move their families back into D.C. and still have a great deal of power on where their children went to school. I like what that gentleman said, that instead of uh, wasting his time in community, he's going to use that time to better the school. And he lives around the corner from that school, and he's there almost every single day. Wow, impressive. Yep. Bert, thank you for that report. Sure. Janet. Well, in Rochester, not only is there a fight for the brightest students, there's also a battle over space. Many charter school leaders say they would love to expand, but the problem, they can't find affordable space. Right now, 22% of Rochester City school buildings vacant. However, District officials told Berkeley Breen the space is not open, leaving charters and parents with limited options. I think that that would be a solution that would solve a couple of different problems. This is Susan. It's not her real name. For personal reasons, she asked us to conceal her identity. She lives in the city, and she wants her son to go to a charter school. But right now, he's on a waiting list. So for her, more space for charters means a space for her son in a charter. You know, there's plenty of space in the Rochester City School District's open that's not being used. 
that tax dollars are paying for to just sit there. So we took this concern to Van White, president of the city school board. Now he's elected by voters citywide, and we asked him, "You have open space in some of your schools. Why not open it to charters?" I'm of the mindset that what we should be sharing are best practices. Not space. Van White believes that city schools can compete with charters, private schools, and suburbs. This notion that we should take whatever available space we have runs counter to that notion. If your focus is, is an us versus them focus, then maybe that's an argument. Jeff Rosenberger is the board chair of the Rochester Prep Charter Schools. Some of his schools are in rented, empty Catholic schools, but one is in a converted party house on Maple Street, and the school is at the mercy of the building owner. The ability for charters to expand is limited by the available space. So there would be more charter seats available to serve more children. But charter school operators complaining about facilities is like people moving next to the airport complaining about the planes. Charter school operators knew they weren't getting any state aid for facilities. They knew this would be a problem. But you knew that going into it, right? We, we knew that going into it. But again, the students who want space in these schools and it's not available didn't know it. Sharing space is not new. In New York City, 66% of charter schools share space with district schools. But again, Van White believes the current open space in Rochester is not permanent. And he says what they're doing in the city school district now is going to demand more space in the future. Who would contest the, the, that that is a rational thought given the fact that the U of R is running East High School? Uh, if you've ever been to well, a They might contest it when they look at... Uh, test scores and graduation rates over the last 10 to 20 years. I'm talking about the next, the next 10 to 20 years. Parents are talking about right now. It won't cost anybody any extra money and it'll get used. More charter schools can open up, more options for more parents. Kids can flourish that way. Well, so far there are no laws in place in our area which would require the Rochester School District to offer space to charters. However, in New York City, the city school district is required to offer space or find space in another private or public building and pay for it. Again, that law only concerns the New York City area. The importance of choice all comes down to one thing, providing a better education for our children, which in turn improves our community. Up next, a closer look at the possible link between crime and poor education. What we found out straight ahead. It's really bad for this community. Um, you know, having a high percentage of dropouts uh, is just a lot more kids on the street without jobs, without a future. Uh, that's why it's called the school to prison pipeline. If you deprive kids of the future, uh, how can you expect them to end up anywhere but prison? Many argue that uh, what happens in the Rochester City School District impacts all of us as a community. The theory being, if you improve the education system, you improve the quality of life for everyone. So it leads to the question, is there a link between crime and poor education? Berkeley Breen went looking for an answer. He continues our Power of Choice coverage tonight with what he found out. Berkeley. Hey Scott, if you don't think that uh, struggling schools in the city and crime by young people affect your taxes and your money, this might change your mind. You're about to meet two 17-year-olds who were in the Monroe County Jail. And when we first reported this last summer, the one thing they had in common is that neither of them were in school when they got arrested. Carlos Serrano. Carlos Serrano should have been in ninth grade at Charlotte High School. Instead, he was serving three months for violating his probation. DeAndre. DeAndre Dent should have been a freshman at Monroe High. He was doing 10 months for robbery. You miss your family a lot. It's not a place to be. Oh, 17 year olds don't want to be here. They were 17 when we talked. Both should have been well beyond the ninth grade. They admit they were not going to school when they got in trouble. They told us they liked the street better. So, who do they blame for that? Myself. Just myself. You don't blame anybody else? No. Nah. You don't blame the school superintendent or your no. teachers? Or... That's my fault. The question is, is there a link between crime, being in jail, and lack of education? Well, here's the evidence. According to the Monroe County Sheriff's Office, a majority of inmates in the Monroe County Jail do not have a high school diploma. Professionally, from my perspective, there, there obviously is a nexus. Ed Ignari is the Director of Rehabilitation for the Sheriff's Office. 
He says most of the teenagers in the Monroe County Jail read and do math at a level four to five grades below where they should be. In New York State Prison, 25% of inmates read below an eighth grade level. And that has a tremendous impact on somebody's ability to make um, good decisions. Here's the irony. While Carlos and DeAndre were cutting class before they got arrested, they had to go to school in jail. Okay, Lipinski, let's go, let's go. You they get go. classes in English, math, science, and writing. State law says free education has to be provided to anyone under 21. And this is where the education and crime nexus is costing you. The average cost to house an inmate in the county jail is $50,000 a year. The average cost per pupil in the city school district, $20,000 a year. So that means through your state and county taxes, you are footing a potential $70,000 bill. If you look at somebody that's here for a whole year, they're, they're costing the taxpayer a, a great deal of money. The total budget for the county jail, $75 million. So now the question is, how did it come to this? Who failed these kids? I think we all have. Superintendent Dr. Bullhen Vargas puts the blame on the city school district, but also families in the community. And he says the failure starts when the kids are young. The sad reality is that I have about close to 3,000 students, some of them in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, that I know come into school. When a first grader or a kindergarten or a second grader is not coming to school, that is all of us, I fell in that child. So what are you doing to change that? We desperately need to improve the district. But the community need to have the sense and urgency that every child, every day, is in school unless that child is ill. We're going to have you come right over here. When DeAndre got out of jail a month after we talked to him, we met him at the Urban League, his first step to getting back on track. He is now enrolled at All City High School, an all boys school, and his mother says he's on track to graduate next year. But you still have a hard time hearing hope when you ask him about the future. So, what's your goal? I mean, a lot of kids have goals, time. right? A lot of teenagers have goals. So, what's your goal? My goal, my main goal is to finish school. That's my main goal. My second goal is find a job or something. Now, we tried to contact Carlos uh, Serrano. He didn't want to talk to us after he got out of jail. My phone call to him this week was not returned. The city school district tells me he is not enrolled in school. We do know that he has a two year old child back at home. Janet? So far, we've talked about a lot of issues facing teachers, parents, students, community leaders. So what do you think? What are you saying about all of this and the power of choice? Jennifer Mobilia joins us now with some of your comments. Jen? Well, a lot of you at home have been sharing your thoughts with us on Facebook and Twitter all day using the hashtag power of choice. And as you can imagine, the topic of educating our children is getting a lot of reaction. Here's just a few of the comments we've received. Jennifer DeLeon writes, Parents can blame the teachers, and teachers blame the parents, but that is not solving anything. We need advocates as parents, as teachers, and as a community who care about the next generation's success. Andrea Fricano says parents need to get involved and become a voice in their child's education. It takes a triangle for success. Teacher, parent, student. Once we get that, our children will soar. And on our post about charter schools, Richard Skippen says charter schools only do well because they exclude students who have learning or emotional disabilities in non-English proficient students. But Ivan Stefanovic disagrees, saying charter schools do not accept only the best and the brightest. In fact, many charter schools are set up specifically to teach students who are struggling academically. Our Facebook post on mayoral control of our schools has the most comments. Amy Irwin says the qualifications for mayor have no overlap with the qualifications for school superintendent. To put a mayor, any mayor, in charge of the schools would be irresponsible. And finally, our piece on suspension and how schools should deal with bad behavior. Jay Murphy writes, some of these kids come from broken homes. No love, no support, minimum to no supervision being neglected or abused. And Wendy Collin writes, kids these days do not connect their bad decisions to the consequences that go along with those choices. The behaviors they are demonstrating are far worse than they were just five to ten years ago. It is very scary working in schools now. 
We want to hear from you. Share your comments about any of these topics using the hashtag Power of Choice. We'll be sharing more of them throughout the evening. Again, that's hashtag Power of Choice. Jennifer, thank you. So what now after hearing all the obstacles and possible alternatives? Up next, what are some things you can do to bring about change and where you should start next? Choice to me, I mean, it gives me a decision. I can make the decision to what I want to do versus having somebody tell me. For me, in choice, with my, with her education, my other children's, it's everything. In this special, you've met the Rochester woman who's running some of the most successful charter schools in Washington, D.C. And the public school principal in the nation's capital who went door to door recruiting students. Tonight at 11, Berkeley Breen tells you the story of the charter school sheriff. Unlike New York, where the state education department and SUNY oversee charters, D.C. has basically one man with the power to grant and rescind them. It's very difficult to have the political will to execute a turnaround in a major school district unless you are faced with the possibility that charter schools could take over the whole system if you don't get better. 45% of students in Washington, D.C. attend charter schools. The size of that enrollment is what officials say forced D.C.'s education establishment to make major changes. So, why does Scott Pearson say charters shouldn't get any bigger? And how many more charters does Rochester need to reach that critical mass? The answers are at 11, and they're going to have an effect on what could happen here. Well, during that trip to D.C., our crews also learned about an organization that advocates for school choice and helps get information to parents about choices available to their children. It's called the Center for Education Reform. There's nothing like it in Rochester. We learned a woman from Buffalo, New York, is now its executive director. Berkeley Breen spoke with her about the need for more options for parents. What difference does that make? Has, it, has it made improvements? Are their lives better? I think it makes a world of difference when you have, when you have a real marketplace for families, you know, a lot of people say, oh, those parents can't choose, those parents, those kids won't be anything. Actually, when we see kids really having a marketplace to choose from, all of our schools do better, traditional and public charter, because they're competing. They're competing for families, they're competing for the consumer, the, the parent. So what should parents be demanding then? Should they get, be getting on the phone and calling their the New York State United Teachers Office and Rochester Teachers Association Office? They won't listen to them. What needs to happen is legislative change so that it takes away the power from those, those special interest groups and puts the power back in the hands of parents. Well, we spoke with members from the local teachers union about that and you'll hear their response on Thursday. We also talked a lot tonight about the power of choice. Now, you had the power to take action. The status quo isn't working for a lot of local children and their families and that's why here at News 10 NBC, we're recommending that if you feel strongly about what we've shown you tonight, Contact Governor Andrew Cuomo's office. Tell him about your concerns and how you feel about education and the power of choice. Now, you don't have to have voted for the governor or even be a fan of his policies. But as the leader of our state, we think he needs to take action to help children and families right here in Rochester. You can call the governor at 518-474-8390 or email him at www.governor.nygov slash contact. We've also made it easy for you on WHEC.com. We put together a sample letter or email to get you started. All you have to do is go to the website and look for the Power of Choice tab. The link for the letter will be at the top. We want to thank you for watching and sharing your thoughts with us tonight. We hope you have a good night. If I had a choice, they'd definitely have a better future. But you don't have too many choices. It made me wonder if, you know, living in Rochester was the, the best, best thing to do at the time. It's something that you kind of look and you're like, wait a minute, what, what's going on in, in the schools um, if you're dead last in New York State? I think it's mostly to do with the parents and the parents getting involved in their children's lives and getting involved in the school. Two of my kids did go to private schools and they did better in the private schools. Uh, although I was paying out of my pocket, but if I could afford it, I would do that. But I couldn't afford it, so... I, I just firmly believe in like different school districts probably could better 
teach my, my child. It's a two-way street. You know, teachers, teachers have to be involved. Um, parents have to be involved. Uh, everyone has to be involved in, in the process.